Thank you so much. I'd asked her a couple of weeks ago to uh, do that because today I began my sixth year of ministry here, and I wanted to celebrate that with that song. I saw it on, I saw it on YouTube, and I, I was like, I need to hear that. And then, you know, some things changed, but then some things changed back. So thank you, Lord, uh, for that, and thank you, Gigi. Praise God. Our uh, scripture text this morning comes from Acts chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 12 through 16. But as always, let me encourage you to go home today and read all of chapter 5. And you might want to read a little bit of chapter 4 again because we're going to bounce back into chapter 4 this morning as well. Uh, And then if you read all of chapter 5 today, then you'll be ready for the sermon next week because I'm going to finish up chapter 5 next week in my sermon. So... Today, we're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 12 through 16. Dr. Luke writes, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word today. Now, in chapter 5, we are introduced to a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And after they had saw the great generosity of Barnabas, remember last week we talked about Barnabas, we talked about the, the son of encouragement. Well, after they saw the great generosity of Barnabas and how well he was respected, the couple decided they wanted to receive the same recognition and respect in their life. So they sold their property, but only gave a small portion of it to the church while implying they had sacrificially gave it all to the church. Now, the story of Ananias and Sapphira is an act of deceit. This couple had vowed to give all the proceeds of the sale to God, but then changed their mind and handed over just a small portion of it. They wanted the image of great generosity without being generous. One commentator wrote, once the love of money takes possession of a person, there is no evil that he cannot and will not do. Ananias and Sapphira not only deceived God and the church, but they also showed their contempt toward God. They showed their arrogance and their lack of faith. Now, in my sermon last Sunday, I I said our giving reflects the conditions of our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, you can fake some things, but you can't fake giving to God. And Ananias and Sapphira found out the hard way that you should not test God. Now, Acts chapter 5 is important for another reason. Within these few verses, we see all three persons of the Trinity represented. When Peter confronts Ananias, he says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Here, Ananias allowed Satan, not God, to fill his heart. And like James says, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. God apparently gave Peter supernatural knowledge of what Ananias was doing. Because Peter did not accuse Ananias of lying to the church or lying to the apostles, but to the Holy Spirit. And Peter clearly believed that Ananias had offended God He said, you have not lied to men, but to God. Then in verse 14, it says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events and all the men and women believed in the Lord Jesus. Now, of course, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was greed in trying to keep the money, but their greater sin was pride in wanting to consider them so spiritually Uh, that they gave it all, but in fact, they did not give it all. Now, this sin is imitated in many ways in the church today. When we create or allow the impression that we are people who read the Bible daily or that we pray daily, when we do not, 
or when we create or allow the impression that we, we've got it all together when we do not, or when we exaggerate our spiritual accomplishments or effectiveness to appear as something we are not, or when we assert the image of our spirituality without the reality of a spiritual life. This type of sin is rooted in pride, and pride corrupts the church faster than anything else. Now, I'm not perfect, and you're not perfect, and because we are the church, our church is not perfect. Only one person ever walked the face of this earth perfectly, and that was Jesus. And I tell people all the time, if you're looking for the perfect preacher and the perfect church, keep on looking. You won't find it here. And if you do find the perfect church, don't join it. Because if you join it, then it won't be perfect any longer. The church as we know it is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. We need to come here and confess our sin and be restored back to a right relationship with God. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, and we need to confess our sins so that we can be in a right relationship with God because we are still all under construction, and God isn't finished with us yet. Now, this is also the first time the word church is used in the book of Acts. The Christian church was both new and old. New because of its relationship and witness to Jesus as Lord and Savior, and old because of the continuation of God's holy people. God found a place for his people, and it was in his church. And the church is now open to all believers without distinction of nationality. As Paul told the Roman church, there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks. The Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Now, in our text for today, we see God's continuing power on full display. God's power is shown through the miracles that were performed and the unity of the people. The disciples, through the power of Jesus' name and faith in Jesus, were able to perform numerous signs and wonders. Now, my dad was recording his video this week, and he said, I don't know exactly how the shadow of Peter heals somebody, but God is not constricted by the way he wants to pour out his signs and wonders, his mercy and his healing into our lives. And that's true for us today. But any power attributed to the name of Jesus originates in the person of Jesus. When we believe in Jesus' name, we are trusting in the finished work of the cross by the risen Christ. If Jesus had not been God in the flesh, who lived a perfect life, who died for the sins of all who believed and rose again, we wouldn't even be talking about his name today, but we are because he was. Jesus has literally given us his name and when I use the name that is above all names, I am confessing that he is mine and that I am his. When we exercise our faith in who Jesus is and what he can do, that's when we tap into the power of God. When we pray in Jesus' name, we come boldly before the throne of God because of the power of his name, the saving, healing, protecting, justifying, redeeming power of God resides in the person of Christ and Jesus is his name. And if you call upon the name of Jesus, he will save you. Do you remember what the angel told Joseph? And you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from our sins. And that's what he wants to do for us. He wants to save us from our sins. It is in Jesus' name that the disciples are able to perform these signs and wonders. And it's through the resurrection power of the Savior that God's people are healed and made whole. And praying in Jesus' name demonstrates our faith in God's power to act in the midst of his people. That's what was happening in Jerusalem in the temple courts, and it's happening here too because we have seen God pour out his healing mercies into people's lives, and they've been made whole. We've seen God work in... in people like Trip Weldon and Larry Dozier, and we're praying, we're going to continue praying for those who are dealing with illness, who are recovering from surgery, so that God will make them whole and, and healthy again. It's in Acts chapter 4, verse 30, that these early Christians prayed that God would continue to do the signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That's how they prayed. And our text shows that this prayer was answered. And these remarkable signs and wonders continue. 
Now, Jesus gives the believers, gives us the authority to serve, work, and pray in his name if we do so believing in Jesus' saving power and desiring God's will to be done in our life. Jesus, with the authority of the Father, exercised his power to save sinners, to save us, and his name is the only name that we can call upon for salvation. And as adopted sons and daughters into God's family, we experience God's saving grace through faith in the person of Jesus. And when we call on him, we participate in the, his power and we find joy in all that we do. When Jesus said to certain people, your faith has made you well or your faith has healed you, he was saying that their faith, their confidence in him had been the means of their restoration. The power of Christ brought the healing, but his power was applied in connection to their faith. Do you remember the movie Faith Like Potatoes? Remember the character in the, you know, the man in Faith Like Potatoes? His name was Agnes Buchan. I think that's how he pronounces his last name. He said this, when men work, they work, but when men pray, God works. When we pray and our faith is connected to the power of God, God moves and acts on our behalf. And God has established prayer as part of his plan for accomplishing his will in this world. And I want to be a part of that plan. That's the plan I want to be a part of. Now, in the same way, salvation comes to a sinner through faith. Everyone who is saved must believe, but it's the power of Christ that saves, not the power of faith. Faith is only the instrument, not the power itself. Jesus said, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it shall be yours. That's how we exercise our faith. When we get down on our knees, we pray like that. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now, in this text that we're looking at today, not only is there prayer, an effective prayer by the disciples and the apostles and, and some of the other people that had gathered in his name that had been saved, but we also read this. They all met together. The King James Version says this, they were all with one accord. Now, often the fact that God's people are all together in one accord, to me, is a greater display of the Holy Spirit's power than any particular sign or wonder. When the church can come together in unity, when we can agree on what color to paint our walls and what color to put our carpet down, and if we can agree on the things that, that God has called us to work on and to do and, and function together as a unit, when we can do that, we begin to see the power of God moving in our church. When we see the unity in the church, we see the power of God at work, not only in our lives, but in our church. But our selfish hearts and our stubborn minds makes it hard to be in one accord. But when God brings us together, we are a force to be reckoned with. There's nothing in this world that can stop us when we are marching with God. I ran across this story. It's an old story, but I think it's an effective story for making the point that I want to make. It was in April of 1831. A brigade of soldiers marched in step across the Broughton Suspension Bridge in England. Now, according to the accounts of the time, the bridge broke apart beneath the force of the soldiers marching in unison, and dozens of men were thrown into the water. After this happened, the British Army sent new orders out to all the detachments. Soldiers crossing a long bridge must break stride or not march in unison to stop this from happening again. God's power is made manifest in the unity of the church, and when we march together in step with God, who can stand against us? Now, shortly before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed for unity among his followers. You find this prayer in John 17. He prayed this. He said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. That name is Jesus, by the way, so that they may be one as we are one. And then later on in that same prayer, Jesus asked that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete, what? Unity. That's what God is praying for us. Je you know, Jesus lives to intercede on our behalf every day. 
And I believe he is praying today for unity in the church. Now, when Jesus prayed for complete unity, he gave us a reason why Christian unity is so important. So that the world may believe that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When the church is united in Christ, the world sees two things very clearly. That God the Father sent his only begotten son to us. And that God loves you just as he loved his son. In Romans 15, Paul gives another reason that Christian unity is so important. He says this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The bottom line is God's glory. God's people should speak with one voice to bring glory to God. Christian unity comes with our Christian maturity, and it's something that we should strive for every day. We need to be Christians that are maturing, that are growing, that, that are, are becoming more like Jesus each and every day. Paul instructs us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Also helping us to have unity in the church are the gifts of the Spirit. God has given each Christian different gifts. You have one, at least one. Everybody's got at least one. And when you exercise that gift, it leads to unity. And it even Paul even talks about the purpose of these gifts. He says this, We all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So to promote Christian unity, God created the church to be a living body, and that body has many members, each with specialized work to do. You have work to do, I have work to do, we all have work to do, but all the parts are united under the head of the body, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now as Christians, from many different backgrounds, we work together in unity to display the power of God and share the gospel. Now think about our diversity for just a second. Think about that, how diversified our church is today and how we can bring glory and honor to God's name by pursuing unity. The power of the Holy Spirit brings us together to be one in Christ through faith. And we will reach Christian unity when we attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Christian unity is something we should strive for every day. I've said that. The unity that faith in Christ brings, it, it extends God's love to all people, and it demonstrates the truth of Jesus. There is absolute truth, and his name is Jesus. In fact, he even said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, unity in the church also foreshadows worship in heaven, where John the Revelator says this, a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language will stand before God and cry out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. One day, we will all be shouting Methodist. Now, I know some of you are sitting there going, not me. But at one time, the Methodists were shouting Methodist. That's how we were looked at by other people. We were shouting Methodist. And that's why we sing when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. When we all see Jesus, we're going to sing and what? Shout the victory. That's what Jesus wants us to do. And I believe there's a shout, shouting Methodist in all of us. He just ain't come out yet. <laughs> but I'm going to keep praying. I love this story because it helps us to understand how we need to pray more effectively in our church for each other. But it also shows us how we need to be unified, how we need to be together. This, this community of believers in Jerusalem had a marvelous reputation for integrity. And everybody knew that it was a serious thing to be a follower of Jesus. And it is still a serious thing to be a follower of Jesus. And the incident with Ananias and Sapphira reduced the level of casual commitment. Yet the church kept growing. Even though people knew it was a serious thing to be a Christian, the Spirit of God kept moving with power. They didn't water down the gospel. 
or compromise the truth. They preached the gospel with power and new believers were added to the Lord, not to a church or a movement or even a denomination, but to God himself. And first and foremost, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a member of the family of God. And we used to sing that song. How does it go? Does anybody remember singing that song in here? How, do, how does it go? Y'all tell me how does that song go? I'm not going to let you leave until you start singing. Cleansed by his blood, join hands with Jesus as we travel this side. Because I'm part of the family, the family of God. You know, during that time in Jerusalem, multitudes of men and women were added to God and the church grew. God's power was on full display when he chose to do these signs and wonders through the hands of the apostles and to bring unity to his church. And if we want to see God's power made manifest in his church today, then we need to start exercising our faith and remain united in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen.